Hi everyone, welcome to Swedenborgian Community Online, your affirming interfaith community, hoping to uplift you wherever you're at, as we hope you do uh, for us as well. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is it, folks. I hope <laughs> you're excited because it is our final book club, as we call it, on heaven and hell. Uh, which means that we're going to be talking mainly about hell. So, so some halting uh, approaches is, is important as we try to decipher what is hell? Does it exist? How can you have hell uh, with an interfaith approach to religion, ministry, as um, I view uh, Swedenborgianism uh, as having? So if you want to join and share some of your thoughts about this topic, hell, uh, please find us at SwedenborgianCommunity.org and, and write us or, or join us live if, um, well, you know if you're joining us or not today, but in the future uh, at SwedenborgianCommunity.org slash worship and share your thoughts. Uh, we like to uplift people's reflections, their questions during the show, so it would be great to have your voice on here as well. And if you actually want your voice on here, uh, we invite you to do that too. Just call in at 646 Five six four nine five seven one. So before we get started, I want to say hello to everyone in the chat see as well. Um, always glad to have you here. I know these book talks are a little tough because there's all this reading coming into it. So I think people like to catch it later. Uh, but reading's optional, folks. You don't have to read. I try my best to summarize uh, each section of Emanuel Swedenborg's book, Heaven and Hell which you can find free on the website too, uh, so that you don't have to read necessarily. But uh, there's a lot of good examples and, and more detail in the book, so I do recommend reading it. So our first section tonight, heading towards the end, is still in uh, this pre-hell part of the book. And it's called, No One Enters Heaven on the Basis of Mercy Alone. So if you're religious at all, especially you know Western Christian, uh, Protestant specifically, you might have heard of this idea of mercy gets you into heaven. Um, and usually it's from faith alone. So you believe in Jesus or you believe in God um, and you accept God as your master, Jesus as your master, and you get into heaven by mercy alone. Well, not deciphering what it means to accept someone uh, as your master right now. Uh, we'll just kind of focus on what Swedenborg says about this. And he says this isn't a thing getting into heaven by mercy alone. Uh, but there is divine mercy, and we'll get to that in a second. So our spirits are our affection in this 18th century mystics thinking. And in our spirits, we actually embody and receive God. We receive heaven or hell uh, in our spirit. And so going into heaven in the next life is actually more about what we receive in freedom uh, in our hearts and in our spirit. So you can't just get into heaven and be like, oh, what a great party. Uh, it's something that you have to want to live because that's what heaven is. It's a type of living. And in Swedenborg's visions, this type of living uh, within, without, uh, applies to all people. It's not just Christians, not just Muslims, not just whatever Swedenborgians are. Uh, for Swedenborg, that's a type of Christian, but uh, we won't get into that today. There's a recent video on that. Uh, so catch it, please. So it doesn't matter what you believe necessarily, what your faith is, um, to get into heaven, but you do have to be oriented towards goodness and life and love to do so. Uh, and we are saved by living a life that essentially follows divine truth, Swedenborg says. So you may not have a scripture in your life, or maybe you have a different scripture than the ones I like, uh, but if you're pulling out of that scripture or out of your life experiences, uh, truth, like real wisdom about how to live your life in a loving, caring way, then you're living, and you live that way, you actually do it, uh, you're living a life according to divine truths, and that's what gets you into heaven. So there is divine mercy, uh, but that mercy is towards all of humanity with the intent on saving every single person, aliens included. But if you want to hear more about aliens, you're going to have to go back to some earlier uh, Heaven and Hell episodes. But, and this never withdraws. Even if you end up choosing hell for 
you know, eternity, God is still applying mercy towards you, uh, allowing you to reject hell and freedom. But we'll get to that. Uh, further, Swedenborg says divine truths establish the design of creation because this is the way God works and how God's structures work. If you look at the minute details of physics, you might see kind of an image of divine truths, for example. Uh, we love science here at uh, SE Org, Sweet Morgan Community Online, uh, so don't be surprised if we talk a bit about it. And God never deviates from this design. Everything in creation, whether it's evolution, how the solar systems form, the uni you know, the, the galaxies, it's all according to the divine design, and God doesn't break that design for his or her own ends. Our higher power does not uh, work against herself. Uh, so this is a quote from Swedenborg. He says, whoever accepts heaven enters heaven. I think that's well put and succinct uh, from Swedenborg. So if we could be saved by pure mercy, though, um, all people would be in heaven, according to this theologian. But this would supplant people's loves if God made us uh, become heaven or made us enter heaven. Because heaven is a spiritual state, a spiritual environment um, of infinite variety, but still oriented towards goodness and love and wisdom. Uh, so if we are to enter that space, we have to receive it. And God can't and won't force it on us. It's against God's design. So heaven isn't a party. <laughs> so we, we actually, in a sense, if you love hellish things, uh, which we'll talk more about, you don't want to enter heaven because you won't find it very fun or to your liking. Um, further, those who believe faith alone saves, or at least think they do, believe heaven must be from pure mercy because they can see, uh, according to Swedenborg, everyone can see that faith without goodness doesn't constitute human life. Like we kind of intuitively know faith without real goodness towards our neighbor, towards the divine qualities in others, towards society, doesn't constitute actual life. Uh, it, it's kind of a hollow word without what you're really about. And then none of the individuals in Scripture, according to him, uh, re, were accepted out of mercy alone. So Abraham, Isaac, on and on and on, Miriam. None of these people are actually received into heaven on mercy alone just because they have a famous name in Scripture. I love that Swedenborg goes into this. Uh, and he says, and I, I, what I get from this in the subtext and reading other parts of Swedenborg's writings is that maybe not all of our favorite characters out of Scripture are actually in heaven. Uh, he says that the reason that they are so esteemed in biblical Scripture and, and Hebrew Scripture is because they refer to the Lord in their deeper meaning. Uh, and we'll talk more about this. I'll keep saying that. But Scripture, according to Swedenborg, has this spiritual meaning, this layered meaning. And there's a literal material covering on most of it, not all of it. But that those stories, those parables, as it says, uh, are actually parables for our own living, for our own heart, and the appearance of things. They're not actually literally about those things. So the Abraham story, although a wonderful story, is actually more about each of us in our own growth with divinity. All right, now we, we're moving to the next section. We've made it through the first uh, eight or so blocks of, of text already. And this next section is called, It is Not So Hard to Lead a Heaven-Bound Life as People Think It Is. Do you think that's true? Do you think that heaven isn't so hard to get into? You may not believe in heaven. I think that's understandable. I spent most of my life not believing in heaven. Oh, well, let's see what Swedenborg says about this, okay? Matthew 11.30, actually we're going to start with Bible. Matthew 11.30 says, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And that's Jesus Christ speaking. So, okay, your yoke is easy, God. But often things seem hard. It seems hard to go to heaven according to my beliefs, according to what I hear. Uh, what do you mean this is easy? <laughs> uh, so Swedenborg says, some people think, uh, and he starts kind of in a very specific example of, this idea, these kind of distorted ideas about getting into heaven. Uh, some people think it takes spurning everything worldly to get into heaven, that it's hard to do so. Um, but that's not true, according to him. In fact, he says spurning everything worldly and material actually 
uh, is a, a gloomy life that often leads to rejecting heaven. Now, I want to pause there. Interesting thought. Maybe it takes a moment to, to swallow. I know it did for me. Uh, and turn to the chat seat because I noticed a little, uh, a little activity there. Greetings. Nice to see you there. Yes, you may be watching this at some other date, but live, this is Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. Uh, Alyssa and I, my, my partner and I, we, we had a beautiful dinner. Of course, I had to, to come and do this, but uh, I think Valentine's Day, if we don't linger too much on the, the negative aspects of, <laughs> of the day, uh, is a, it's a nice time to uplift love in various guises, we'll say. And as you'll see when we get to the hellish section, it's all about love, even in hell, weirdly enough. So, huh, maybe it's providence that we're talking about hell on Valentine's Day. Who knows? Uh, the video I just mentioned, hmm, I think you're talking about the video where we, we speak about aliens. I think that's the very first video. <laughs> I should just do a video about aliens, of course, so I can just say, hey, the alien video, put it in. Um, <laughs> but that's not there yet. Maybe by the time you watch this, it is. Uh, so hopefully you can find it, Paige. Uh, sorry about that. There's also a book about that Swedenborg published about aliens, life on other planets, uh, published by the Swedenborg Foundation. Full disclosure, uh, I'm on the board of the, the foundation. And also, towards the end of Secrets of Heaven, also called, called Arcana Celestia by Swedenborg, other books you can download for free at swedenborgandcommunity.org slash explore. Uh, there's big chapters on aliens. And, those, and that's different material than the one he publishes later. So... I was really happy to find, find that stuff. Hope that helps, Paige. So he says, heaven's life is actually a life of actively engaging with the world, not, as we, we said before, the, the denouement, um, a life of worldly rejection. And because heavenly life must go from the heart to activity, and heavenly life entails loving goodness in other people, divinity in other people, the neighbor, uh, and God uh, herself, it involves community. It involves some connection and uplifting. Uh, and so he says, often when we spurn everything worldly, we, we're also doing that in our spiritual stance towards community and like worldly connections, um, not worldly evil. <laughs> if we spurn worldly connections, then we actually find that heaven's bewildering when we die, according to Swedenborg. And we move off. We're like, I didn't like society then. I don't like it now, <laughs> apparently. So if we live an inner life without an outer life, uh, it's like living in a house without a foundation. It's, it's a soul without a body, which eventually apparently happens. Although the spiritual world is in connection with the physical world, uh, we can't have a soul initially without a body. We have to develop a spirit. Um, and then God will take it from there, even in, in children, as, as we covered in one of the first videos. So our spiritual life is united to our worldly life like a soul with a body. And moral and civic living is what the spiritual life does, um, as intending well is a spiritual life's essence. So spiritual life in itself, in the, the positive sense, is about intending well, doing well, wanting to. And if that's really your goal, your aim, you're going to do it. Uh, you can't really intend well and not do it unless you're, you're literally, uh, you know, held down or something. So in a spiritual life, moral and civic living is genuine, uh, unlike when we do it just for appearances or reputation's sake. So often in this life, in this world, in our society, we look around and people are wearing masks. Uh, we often wear masks. I might be wearing one right now. And it's usually hiding our real intentions, our uh, real thoughts. And we can manipulate wisdom. We can actually sound very wise and yet be very evil in intent in this life, according to Swedenborg. And so we wear these masks and we, we fake it. Often we do civil and moral things because we're afraid of our reputations. We're afraid of punishment in this world. But if we do it because our spiritual life, our heart, really, truly loves the good in those moral ideas, those civic ideas, those laws, um, and they're really good laws, right? Um, then 
though those are genuine in us, those moral and civic postures and, and actions are genuine in us. And in the next life, according to Sweden, where people uh, act without external constraints. And so we behave very unwisely if we love hellish things without external constraints because we're no longer worried about our reputation or at least impacted by that worry in the same way. Uh, and we, we act kind of crazy because internally we are crazy. We want to do things that people, if they saw us doing them, would lock us up for, would reject um, our presence around them for, for good, for good reason, right? Doing evil things. Albert shares a Vide type citation. Oh, yes, great, Albert. The best and the most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. Helen Keller, author. Yes, Helen Keller, as you well know, is a wonderful activist and an author, as Albert shares, and also a pro, uh, professed uh, Swedenborgian. Um, he, she, uh, sh Helen, <laughs> Shellen, no, that's not right. Uh, Helen actually wrote a book about her Swedenborgianism called My Religion. So read it, it's a great book. Buy it in that version because I've noticed there's a new version out with updated English? I don't get it. It's, her text is really beautiful. So get my religion. It's like two bucks used. It's beautiful. Thank you, Albert. That's wonderful. So the Ten Commandments, according to Swedenborg, describe the laws of the spiritual, moral, and civil life uh, in biblical and Hebrew texts. So those who in, don't internalize these laws and in these, these broad senses, intentionally or not, uh, and acknowledge divinity often seem to do them due to outward constraints, but internally they reject many of them and even murder in their hearts. Uh, so they often seem to do these things, and it's due to outward constraints, but they really reject it. They're not about it. And they would uh, break these laws outwardly if they could get away with it, according to Swedenborg. So things like the Ten Commandments, uh, some of the moral, civic, and uh, spiritual laws in Hinduism, the Vedas, and the Quran, these things hopefully do a good job um, describing how we should live within and without so that we're not hurting people. Uh, and we have to discern. You know, you can read the Ten Commandments in multiple ways. And so really being discerning, reflective, uh, and, and trying to uplift the good, even in the Scripture, uh, even in our, really, in our interpretation of Scripture, uh, is, is really important for our living and connecting with divinity, each other, uh, and heaven. And so these senses reveal themselves in the next life. And our loves really are the sources of our intentions and our focuses, as well as our inner sight, how we look at things, uh, whether it's clear or distorted. Uh, you, you may have an example in your political uh, life, in whatever country you're in, where... Uh, a leader or leaders are distorting truths for their own, um, you know, evil, or they're just outright saying falsity for their for their own selfishness and selfish gain. Uh, so, Swedenborg is saying this is what we do. We actually distort how we look at the world based on our heart. So I guess we shouldn't find it surprising. It's still very unfortunate, right? So a primary love for ourselves, um, like for our selfishness and the world um, in, in, our, in our loves, the primary love of these things, sorry, directs our inner reaches downward, so to speak. And it closes our inner minds, our higher reaches of our thoughts and intentions and, and love. Uh, and so uh, we should actually be aware that the more selfish we are, the, the more narrow our gaze and the shallow where we are, and, but we don't have to be. We can actually be more joyful and heavenly if we choose to start accepting those qualities from heaven and divinity. So on the other hand, a deep love for heavenly qualities opens up our inner reaches and our sight uh, so that we can see things in greater and greater true perception, real uh, wisdom. Those who have their hellish loves um, in the primary spot of their intentions and actions to the, the suffocating of their other loves, uh, get their soul delight from what comes in through their physical senses, according to 
a manual, and their sensory experiences include many criminal and obscene things that they uh, cannot be distracted away from because there's no inflow from heaven into their thinking and living. So once we start reflecting on our lives, we can actually be distracted further and further away from our different types of evil or criminal intent uh, in, in our spiritual life and our moral life and on. People who have their inner reaches, reaches open in their minds, on the other hand, can see the evil and false elements in themselves because their inner sight is open and these things are below their spiritual mind. And uh, it's almost like gazing down on, on a field from hilltop. You can easily see the details uh, and you, you probably have binoculars. Hey, greetings, Bill. Hope you're well. Thanks for uh, connecting today. Uh, and the, the rest of you on, on uh, our live chat and uh, audio, hope you're doing well. Share, share what's going on in your lives. We're, we're curious, uh, even in a talk like this. So, Swedenborg also says the reason a heavenly life is not so hard, uh, as this section declares, is because it's simply a matter of recognizing that when something attractive comes up, that we know is this honest or unfair, that it shouldn't be done because it is against the divine commandments and uh, divinity's quality. So he says that's why it's easy. <laughs> I hope that we can start to find uh, that that's true in our living. Further, he describes this a little bit uh, more clearly, I think. We can get used to thinking like this in this reflective way and, and starting to reject these unfair things uh, as we form a habit out of thinking like this. So we can just start forming a habit of reflecting on our intentions, our thoughts, and, and wanting and, and trying to be discerning about whether they are dishonest, unfair, evil. Uh, and then as we act like that, as we start doing this more and more, we are actually gradually more and more connected to heaven. And the higher levels of our, our minds, uh, as this happens, are more and more opened, and we have a greater ability to see and dispel what is dishonest and unfair in our living and in the world even. Because the structures of the world, the systems of the world, often are images of what humans are receiving on this planet and what our leadership uh, is receiving. And that can be unfortunate, but there is hope in dispelling those distortions within and without. We enter this state of reflecting and more and more connection with divinity and heaven with freedom, from freedom, gifted by the Lady, the Lord, within and above. And as we do and act from this freedom in this way, uh, God works wonders in our lives and causes us to start refusing evils, actually refusing them, not just being aware of them. We want and start refusing evils, uh, want to stop refusing, and eventually turn away from them entirely, I hope. So that's the promise. That's what Swedenborg believes is part of the process of uh, being united to heaven. Now, although this process may generally be easy, if we choose to enter it, according to him, the more we do evil deliberately, the harder resisting and even seeing these things uh, becomes, seeing these evil things. So, that's interesting. He says it's easy, but then he says, well, if you've been doing it for a while, it gets harder. Oh, that's why we're finding it so hard, right? <laughs> uh, but I, I think that there's still hope there, right? We are called to see it more and more, to start breaking our habitual uh, connections to evil or habitual acts of evil and intentions uh, according to our own selfishness and, and falsities. And, and this becomes easier and easier. Um, but yes, it's harder the more we actually do evil deliberately. In fact, if we start doing evil deliberately, uh, we start to rationalize them. We love them, right? So we want to make excuses for ourselves as to why they are just fine uh, because they gratify our loves. They, they seem to fulfill what we think we uh, really appreciate. Um, and so we even call them permissible and good eventually. And we make, so these excuses 
often become us defining these good things, uh, these things in our life that are, aren't good as good. Uh, and so we call them good things. We call them uh, things that are actually uh, uplifting and, and heavenly. If that's how we talk, you may call them something else. <laughs> now those who mortify themselves, and I see a lot of this mortification in movies, right? Uh, where the religious, usually the religious uh, antagonist mortifies him or herself with like a whip uh, or does something else, beats themselves up constantly. Uh, so those people, those types of people according to Emmanuel, uh, or those who distance themselves from society, actually live this, this dark and uh, gloomy life, as Swedenborg likes to put it. And they lack active thoughtfulness towards others and themselves because they're not cultivating thoughtfulness. And they're not acting out of thoughtfulness. But the life of angels, which are dead folk in, in heaven, according to Swedenborg, is a cheerful life, a blessed life, uh, where they're not rejecting society, they're not moving away, they're, they're living in some activity with society, maybe in their own way, maybe with their own uh, people, but they have a, a positive stance towards the diversity around them. They want to uplift it, and they're, they're working in society in a blessed way. And so this consists of thoughtful activities, not uh, no activity or, or thoughtlessness. Further, those who withdraw are often aflame from a sense of their own worth. And they constantly crave heaven because they see it as a reward. Um, instead of what it really is, uh, which is in the next life, uh, it becomes a place of solitude and peace, a place where our internal expressions of heaven in this life are, uh, you know, made bountiful and visible in the next, in the spiritual realm. And so they're bewildered by that. They're bewildered by the realities of heaven. And you can hear a lot more about them in earlier, all the earlier videos. Uh, and so they actually move off, as we described. Partic particularly those who mortify themselves or who are in constant actual prayer uh, you know, removing themselves from society, think of themselves as gods. So I think it's interesting, Swedenborg is describing people who are always in prayer, like in churches, he says. People who are always in prayer in churches actually often think of themselves as gods. Yeah, that's something we should be aware of and on guard of uh, within ourselves. And whether or not we pray all the time in the church, we may pray all the time towards something else in our lives, right? Uh, and we're wrapped up in self-love if we are like that, if we're uh, thinking of ourselves as gods and, and constantly, essentially, esteeming ourselves as more than all other people. Well, that's, that's all of the non-hellish parts of this book. So, deep breath, we're about to plunge below. I'm curious if there are any thoughts before we move on. Um, you know, I find even the hellish part, although sometimes a little dark and twisted, as you might expect, uh, it's not too bad. So you don't have to switch off. You don't have to be afraid. Uh, we will get through it partly, and I think this is a beautiful uh, thing that Swedenborg uplifts, partly because the Lord governs the hells, which is the name of our next section, starting in number 536 in Heaven and Hell. The Lord governs the hells. So let's lay a little groundwork here before we dive in, figuratively, spiritually. Uh, the relationship of heaven to hell and vice versa is like the relationship of two opposites that act against each other, according to, to Swedenborg. The equilibrium of which allows everything to exist. Maybe a little more detail, as we described earlier, all kinds of people are in heaven from all different backgrounds, different planets. All kinds of people, though, are also in hell. So hell is pluralistic, too, I guess. Uh, you know, equal opportunity uh, prison, as most are. Uh, but is it a prison? Well, let's find out. So for heaven and hell to stay in balance, uh, the ruler of one must be the ruler of the other, according to Swedenborg, the Swede. Uh, so... Does that make sense to you? I don't, 
I don't know if it does for me. Share, share your thoughts on it. So the Lord governs both heaven and hell because everything needs to be managed. It's kind of like, you know, if you were to say the Lord had put the hells at bay or held them, um, you know, in control so that they weren't hurting people too wantonly, you would say the Lord controls the hells. And this is essentially what Swedenborg's saying. And so he controls, she controls the attacks of the hells and restrains its madness because truly hellish intention, which is what creates hell, according to Swedenborg, is a type of madness. It's loving yourself and material over all other people um, to the extent that you would even hurt and, and hate those who act against whatever your form of selfishness or materialism is. Uh, and apparently those can be different things, selfishness in the way Swedenborg defines it, and then loving material wealth. And I find that fascinating. I was just listening to um, a, a podcast on H.H. H. Holmes called Lore. At least the one I heard was about H.H. H. Holmes, the, the serial killer in Chicago. And he did a lot of the things he did clearly for more money. He seemed to be obsessed with money. And he murdered maybe a couple hundred people. Insane, right? Um, he found he could get away with it, so he did it. And Swedenborg says often hell is the people who would do atrocious things if really get away with it. Uh, so if the Lord didn't control hell in this way, uh, the balance would be destroyed. Because really the thing that you need to maintain isn't heaven, because heaven is all about freedom and, and balance, um, really. But hell. But you need the hell in a balance to heaven because you need hell to help um, illuminate the truths of heaven. It's kind of like the shadow to the light. You need the gradients to be able to discern anything in field of view. And unfortunately, this freedom that allows for this kind of global sphere of action, hellish side and heavenly side, um, the freedom that allows for that has to exist for life to exist. Um, for, for finite human beings and, and aliens and the image and likeness of God uh, and nature as well in all its forms in a type of image of God um, has to uh, be allowed freedom to, to do it out of love. Uh, if you didn't have freedom to turn away from these good things and do their opposite, it wouldn't be real freedom. And then uh, we wouldn't really be freely acting individuals. And that's what God's about. God wants freely acting individuals, which is why he doesn't force everyone in hell uh, to have a heavenly love in life. Uh, it's not because God wants to punish people in hell, uh, as we'll find out. So this balance uh, that the Lord ensures isn't one like a balance of physical, like in a physical fight between two people, but it's a spiritual one between benevolent truth and malicious falsity. Uh, this balance is what allows for our freedom, as we were reflecting on, to intend, to, to want to do things, and to uh, think in orientations toward heaven and hell. So the aura of heaven is actually an aura of benevolent truth in its uh, most general sense. Yes, there are auras in the spiritual realm. I think that makes sense that a lot of our fantastical ideas and maybe even true here in a sense, because we're, we're still connected to the spiritual realm in this life, um, come from the spiritual realm. I think that makes sense to me. Uh, it's, it's interesting that Swedenborg wrote a lot of these descriptions before some of them became popular. Uh, so there's an aura from heaven of benevolent truth. Um, and angels uh, also have an aura of this type of truth in their various ways. But ultimately, all these things come from God, the Lady. Um, and this... Aura restrains the rage, the rage of the effort to destroy goodness and truth rising up from hell. Um, and it's that restraint uh, of hell, that restraining of hell, that allows for equilibrium, according to the Swede. And all power, all power, is from actual truth, not from falsity or, or hell. Uh, all real substance form and power uh, is from divinity. Now, when we're in the world, uh, we are actually in the balance between heaven and hell. Uh, 
So our spirits are in this balance in the world of spirits, um, although our spirits are connecting to heaven and hell. And the world of spirits is also in this balance in general, which if you remember from our last video, uh, the world of spirits is kind of a processing space between heaven and hell um, that we, most of us enter as we discern what we are really about, what we really love. Further, he says there's an opposing hellish community for every heavenly one. Uh, and so heavenly ones have uh, communities, have different affections and, and wisdom to, inherent to them. And that's what dis discerns and defines communities in heaven and actually creates space in heaven is different types of loves towards goodness. And hell, on the other hand, has an opposite of that, um, a community opposite to, to every heavenly one with its own evil affection and consequent falsity. Because all evil uh, is, is kind of fed and takes form in distortion, in falsity. That's why we're always pairing evil with falsity. Uh, and as we'll, we'll learn, evil people who love using at least material truth and, and the appearance of spiritual truth for their own evilness lose that ability in the next life. Because the Lord uh, wants everything to be whole, finally, right, in, in the next life, in the spiritual uh, realm. So everything lives in oppositions, according to Swedenborg. We're going to get a, a little uh, breakdown of, of reality uh, from Swedenborg in this section. Everything lives in oppositions. You can't have anything without it. Uh, oppositions enable us to know uh, natures of things and levels. Uh, so there's small and large. Uh, there's, uh, you know, light and dark. And actually, he says, opposition is a source of all perception and sensation. Now, we may or may not agree with his ideas here. He, he's still writing from himself, right? This is not divinely wrote. Um, this is a 18th century theologian sharing his insights as, as he's learning from heaven, from angels, from the Lord, uh, from his experiences. And so this is his opinion. He likes to summarize things from his worldview, as we all do. He's not infinite, no matter what you think. I, 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 that's, what, that's what he says. Um, maybe he was wrong, I don't know. <laughs> but like with heaven, there are three levels of hell, uh, according to Swedenborg's experiences, opposite to them. And uh, these are in balance together, in, in opposition and then further, the things that give rise to these oppositions in the natural world, I guess, is, is where he's going with this. Uh, there's a general governing of hell by the entire heaven, a more specific restraining by heavenly communities opposite to each hellish one. So whether it's natural or, or spiritual, there's a balance um, and, and opposition. Most specifically, in these examples, angels are given the ability to look into hell and actually check the insanities and riots there. And that's the most specific example of how heaven balances out hell. Angels actually look in and say, look what's going on, let's do something. Uh, they can be sent there even, although they can manage things without being sent there, they can be sent there, which, mean, which brings things under even further control. Uh, now generally, the thing that controls hell is fear. Maybe fear of that angel showing up. Maybe it's uncomfortable for them to, to have the light and warmth of heaven come in, reveal their inner nature and, and distortions. Uh, I think we'll learn more about it. Fear, though, wh whatever it comes from, uh, is the main way of maintaining and uh, limiting how people act in hell. And God isn't about torture for torture's sake in hell. According to Swedenborg, God isn't about uh, fear for fear's sake, but uh, those in hell, like people here, often are fearful of consequences, um, and so that keeps them somewhat in check. And these fears are instilled in the world, and they're living, although that diminishes over time, uh, according to Emmanuel. But it also takes on fear of spiritual punishments which are various. Uh, there are various severities, various types of punishment. So there's still a type of torture, you could say, in hell. Uh, and this is a key method to preventing evil in the hells. But 
I will use the word torture, but this punishment, these tortures you should say, or you could say, maybe punishment's better, right, are actually leveled out from by each other. As these hellish spirits do evil, they actually reject divine protection. And then their neighbor, who's maybe hurt or something, reacts or does their type of evil back. And as these hellish spirits do their evil, um, the, these punishments kind of come naturally with that evil, kind of fits the evil, because it's a distortion, and so a distortion to their life occurs, and they don't like it. They, <laughs> although they're doing evil, they don't really like the fact that it's coming back onto them, uh, and that actually teaches them, okay, I don't want to do this because I'm fearful of the consequences. So, so really, uh, it's not the idea of hell that most of us have from from our our uh, Bible study class or, or what have you. <laughs> I'm sorry if that if they talked about hell that way in, in your Bible study class, um, but often that's the case, unfortunately. So in hell, malevolent spirits, the most malevolent spirits, take often take leadership roles for a time. Uh, they're they're given power because they have a lot of experience and skill in their malevolency. Um, and so they keep others in obedience because they don't want other spirits really doing their own thing. They want to dominate with their own evil. Uh, but they're still in fear in their own right, right? Uh, but they, they tend to rise to the, the top because they're the most malevolent and uh, skillful in, in doing evil. But they are limited by uh, fixed limits um, in terms of what they can actually do. Maybe because of fear. I don't know, Swedenborg just says they're limited. They can't do everything they want. Uh, there's limitations there. And they change often because there's actually a lot of rebellion and betrayal and plotting in hell. Oh, that's the hell that we can get behind, right? That's the one that makes sense. Yeah, um, makes sense that if you're a hellish spirit, you, you tend to betray and rebel. Now, Swedenborg ends this section by saying, okay, we talked about punishment. He even uses the word torture. Um, but we talked about this stuff. I want you to know that it's the only way. It's the only way of controlling these violent rages from people. Especially in the spiritual state where they're not limited by their reputation. And often even in that state, we have to control them, punish them by putting them in a box is what we often do in this realm. We, we're not much about rehabilitation in this life, although this is the time for it, folks. That's what we should be about. But um, it's these punishments that can control these spirits, he says. Um, yeah, but the punishments only come when they're doing evil because it's a natural uh, yin-yang type of thing or more like a consequence, right? You, know, you hit the ball, the ball moves. Okay, looks like we have some, some comments. Uh, this, it's, a, it's a little tough section. I think it's, it's hard to reflect on people being punished, just using that word. Uh, and yet, often in our society, many millions, tens, hundreds of thousands of people in our countries are being punished. Uh, and often much worse than we think for, for crimes that our society uh, helped helps to really uplift because we're not about rehabilitation and often our uh, you know, law and order efforts have some distortion because our government has some distortion. Our intentions do and, and we tend to punish addicts instead of uh, rehabilitating them. Uh, and on and on, I could, I could keep going. So what are you all saying in the chat seat? I think whether or not something is divine, uh, this is coming from Albert, depends on the level of truth in it. Not whether it was heard from the Supreme Being direct in the highest heaven to the lowest plane, Earth. Yeah, um, the truth comes to us in various ways, whether it's direct or indirectly, I like how you put it there. Um, what, but it re really matters is whether it is uh, actually true. That's what makes it divine. Love that thought. And then you say, yeah, truth and love combined. And yeah, this is a, a kind of a motif that you'll see even in biblical and Hebrew scripture and other scriptures as well. Like a pairing of words. 
and often it's one word has to do with like heart and affection and the other word has to do with wisdom and truth because these things are paired together like love and wisdom uh, to make a whole you know wisdom is the form of love uh, and then a third uh, aspect of that that Swedenborg reiterates in one way or another is action so it's like having love and wisdom in act living out of love and wisdom whatever you call it it's about having this at heart and actually doing something about it. Um, and then the opposite is also true, as, as you've heard. Thank you, Albert. So the, the next small section before we get to the, the major uh, uh, chapter is there is no devil who rules the hells. Uh, not Satan, not devil doesn't exist. There is no one. Uh, being who maybe was an angel before and cast down, according to Swedenborg, uh, didn't happen. He says that the reason we've developed these ideas is because, uh, you know, looking at some of Scripture's uh, stories about it, verses about it, we've kind of taken them and uh, made them very literal and materialistic. So we've read them very literally. It's not an allegory for our own hellishness. It's, this is a very true story. Not about me, right? <laughs> and also, we just kind of took them further. You know, we, they have a life of their own, right? Uh, especially <laughs> Satan, the ideas around Satan. Um, but instead, Swedenborg says the devil and Satan actually mean a hell in our propensities toward hell. And he also goes into what like, parts of hell each of those words mean. You can read about it uh, if, you, if you want to. And then th there are no created demons either. There is nothing in heaven or hell or any spiritual realm um, besides divinity itself, really, but that's outside of time, right, uh, that didn't have a material life at some point. And even divinity eventually did and always does within us, in a sense. Uh, so there's nothing, no demon, no angel who wasn't a type of person, a being. Um, and there are tons of those beings. <laughs> there, uh, since the beginning of creation, from every planet with, with life on it, sentient life especially, uh, you know, those folks <laughs> are in heaven or hell. So there's a ton, a ton of folks. A ton of people. <laughs> so the next section is called, The Lord Does Not Cast Anyone Into Hell. Spirits cast themselves in. Now, it's interesting because as you probably know, Scripture talks about God casting people into hell. Or it says, you will be cast into hell. Um, I guess it's you casting yourself into hell. Uh, let's, let's hear more about it. I think it may be already making sense to us, uh, especially if you know Swedenborg, but let's learn more. Uh, God does not turn her face away from people ever. Um, doesn't get angry with them. Doesn't cast them into hell. Even if Scripture seems to be saying it according to the Swede. Now, Scripture says this sometimes in the most literal stories, the most literal meaning of Scripture, um, because it describes the appearance of things, how things seem often to the person, um, you know, on a material plane, looking in or, or, or looking down. Uh, but really, these things are... Uh, of our own accord. We actually turn away from God, not the other way around, right? Uh, so, what is, what, what, what does scripture mean when it says, you will be uh, cast into hell or, or God will be angry at you? Well, really it's, it's just your excitement um, and your, your rejection of God, ultimately. So, God is goodness and love and mercy itself. As scripture also says, right? Scripture goes through great lengths uh, to highlight the love and mercy of God. And if that God were to truly turn away, if our higher power were to reject us, we wouldn't be human. We wouldn't exist. So often in our religious sects, we'll say, oh, God rejects them, hates them. Uh, but it's actually uh, our destruction in our spirit, our our propensity to hate <laughs> that uh, causes us to hate God. Uh, and often in Scripture, it, it turns it the other way around because it attributes 
even evil often to God in, in a strange sense, uh, in, in a literal uh, writing of Scripture. Now, God is constantly tries to lead the evil away from e evil, even when they are in hell and have chosen hell, and also always strives to lead the good into more and more good. This is what God is about, and is always what uh, he does. And the Lord strives to even free people from hell, if that were uh, possible, maybe it is. Uh, in Swedenborg's experience, it doesn't seem to be, but God's always trying, so if God hasn't given up, I guess we shouldn't, right? Uh, especially in this realm where uh, Swedenborg highlights how true transformation of heart is always a step away in this world. Uh, and so thus, it is us who cast ourselves into hell. Oh, see you, Paige. Good night. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting discussion to have on Valentine's Day, that's right. You like the thought that God, she, he, high power, loves everyone despite how it may look on the material plane. Oh, well, thank you for uh, that, Paige. Happy Valentine's Day to you. And um, that's, yeah, it's a beautiful thought. God loves you. Uh, even in the midst of hell, God loves Hitler. Dare I say, uh, God deeply cares about uh, Hitler's spirit. Adolf Hitler, if you were wondering which Hitler I was talking about, um, and wants to uplift Hitler. I think we should actually try to feel the same towards um, all the types of people that this universe creates. Uh, of course, we feel the same towards their victims and, in fact, want to protect and change those circumstances. And really, it's that transformation in living in society that's the true ultimate of a love within, of a just a love for justice and, and God's peace within, it's trying to enact it in society. So, uh, yeah, the more we're about that, the better. Swedenborg describes how when we first die, we are taught and led by angels, people from heaven. But we can decide to continually spurn them and reject them. So even Hitler unless he just went straight into hell, which is a possibility, um, had angels hoping to, to teach him, uh, perhaps teaching him still. And, but we can spurn them, we can reject them, and get more and more involved with spirits caught up in the evils that we love. Um, and really it's about us, it's about each of us. Um, not dismissing others for their thoughts, um, Really, but really being discerning about how to uplift good in them and in ourselves. And we are drawn of our own accord and freedom into hell. We, we choose hell, as, as we described. And we also shy, shy away and hide from insight, uh, from the light shining down from the spiritual sun, which is God and its warmth. So as you may have heard in some of our earlier uh, sessions on heaven and hell, the environments of heaven and hell have, uh, you know, deep meaning. Depending on what your environment is, it, it speaks to your heart. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. But there is a spiritual sun, which is, um, in appearance, a spiritual sun. You can feel the heat and light, uh, which is God, because God gives off love and wisdom, heat and light. Uh, and so everything in the material world is actually kind of a form or metaphor for the spiritual realm. Uh, and it can't, can't happen otherwise. Now, the next section is entitled, All the people who are in the hells are absorbed in evils and consequent falsities because of their love for themselves and the world. Uh, hopefully we're breaking out of our <laughs> absorption, uh, whatever the word is, into evils and falsities. But that's what hell's is about. Uh, so, so be on the lookout within. There is no one in hell devoted to evil goals, but also interested in true perceptions. It's not a thing. Um, in this life, though, in this world, uh, the more hellish of us, you know, maybe us in our more hellishness, may be interested in material truths or spiritual truths just for evil's sake. So we can kind of be about truth in a sense, but it's really to to use it for our own selfish, uh, egotistical gain or material gain, what have you. And it's not really for the worth of those 
truths or that goodness. It's not for its intrinsic quality, which comes from divinity. Um, now, every spirit that chooses evil is distilled to a spiritual state that is only interested in the falsity and distortions that fits their evil loves in the next life. Uh, and this happens before they cast themselves into hell. So there's a distillation process, even, even in uh, the spiritual realm, uh, with us specifically. And at that point, bodies, faces, behaviors that we present in that realm match our evil and falsity in their distortions. And so everything about us, from the way we look to the way we sound, is actually kind of a metaphor for our hellishness, or on the other hand, our heavenliness. Uh, you can maybe start to see why poets like William Blake and, and others, um, like Helen Keller and Emerson, love Swedenborg, because it kind of gave a real depth to metaphor, to uh, descriptors. Uh, and in this state, we have turned away from the Lord towards gloom. Uh, Swedenborg's word, <laughs> it's a good one though, says so even the way we face corresponds to our internal state in the next life. So even the way we turn our bodies, uh, but we can still see around us, interestingly, we can still see people even at vast distances if we choose to and it's allowed and they, often if they want us to, especially if we're hellish and they're angelic, um, but uh, we face the way that we're about because orientation has to do with our hearts. Now there are gloomy and dark objects in the opposite directions from the divine sun and moons of heaven. Uh, so if you love God, if you love uh, love itself, its qualities, you're facing the divine sun, or uh, if you love wisdom, you're facing the moons, which are brighter than the, the sun here, according to him. Uh, but if you reject those things and turn to their opposite, which is a supreme love of self, supreme love of material, uh, you're facing kind of dark things, um, interestingly enough. Now, the propensities of hellish spirits run the gamut. Uh, you may be able to list a few things. He does. Uh, some of these things include contempt, hatred, vengefulness, envy, hostility, savagery, cruelty, um, etc., etc., right? And each community within hell is kind of grouped within whatever their hellish propensity is, like in heaven. And because people's faces represent their spirit, uh, hellish ones are frightful, uh, like corpses. And I love this section because I'm sure you may not be one of these people, but a lot of us are. We, in today's world, we like zombie stuff. Right? We like zombie shows. There's this new one called Kingdom uh, from, I think it takes place in China, yeah. It's great on Netflix. Uh, that's my pop culture plug for the day. But it's interesting that these hordes of, of zombies, in a way, kind of clearly represent our hellishness, especially in that show, um, as the corruption in that political realm, you know, just China, in ancient China, uh, this zombie show takes place. As that corruption reveals itself and continues, the zombie uh, outbreak continues, actually thanks to that corruption, because the corruption can never quite get a handle on it, because it's always looking out for itself in a very uh, personally selfish way. And so the, the zombies continue. It's interesting that that symbolism is there often in, in pop culture, um, and Swedenborg is uplifting that as what we'll see in the, the spiritual realm. So some of these faces and people look burnt, uh, maybe even full of ulcerated sores. This is the most graphic I'll get. <laughs> and often there's no visible face, uh, just something hairy and bony and with only teeth. So I'm thinking of like all those monsters and even like children's books or like, oh, I don't know what kind of children's books I've been reading, but you know, the ones where it's just like teeth, the kids will draw often, uh, interestingly enough. Just with teeth, uh, Swedenborg says, often evil spirits look that way. Wow. And then bodies are also misshapen, and their speech embodies their wrath. Uh, so, you know, the wrathful voice of a, of a spirit in a haunted house movie it has maybe some, some sourcing from the spiritual realm. Um, and it can also embody their hatred, their vengeance, or, or what have you. So in summary, all these images of the hellish um, community 
um, all their forms are oriented toward their their uh, love. They they represent their loves of evil, uh, whatever the form of that evil, uh, which are opposite to the the beauty and, and loving presence and forms in in heaven. And so the beauty of heaven actually transcends our uh, comprehension. Um, he doesn't actually say this about hell, but maybe we can. The the horror of hell is something we don't want to <laughs> try to comprehend, right? Further, Swedenborg hadn't been shown the form of hell overall, he says, at least at this point in his writing career. Uh, but like how heaven resembles a single humane being, to be inclusive of our alien cistern, um, all of hell resembles a monster or a devil. Uh, so, you know, you... You can look at each community as having the form of a spiritual person, according to Swedenborg. That this image of a human, of a humane being, is actually from divinity, not the other way around. We don't project the good things from ourselves on the God. God hopes to project them onto us, right? Um, and uh, this, this hologram, uh, as many physicists will describe the universe being, is true even in the spiritual realm. Uh, but, however, you know, not to start feeling too bad for these evil spirits, uh, in their own light, the evil spirits look human. Yes, that's Earl. He looks normal. You know what? What are you talking about? <laughs> but with even a ray of a light entering their, their realm, their community, uh, their monstrosity starts to reveal itself to each other, even for them. Like, they're like, oh, that's not good at all. Whoa. Uh, and I have to live by you, you know, and then they hide from it. So uh, kind of like that image we often see of, you know, light coming into a cave and everything dark running away, hiding from it. Uh, Swedenborg describes that's actually what happens in hell if, if a light from heaven happens to enter, uh, which is, is very rare. Uh, but the illumination of hell is like that of glowing coals or burning sulfur uh, versus the, the real light of heaven. Uh, which is pure darkness uh, relative to heavenly light, and if, and if heavenly light enters, it becomes pure darkness, even for them. Now, the love for self and the world that reign in hell are uh, these loves that, that draw them into these dark places, and it takes up the core of their thinking and their loving. Uh, and it's, it's always regarding itself. It's always being oriented towards itself and everything that they do and their acting and intending and it's, it's wanting to quench everything else, wanting to kind of dispel it for the most part, especially in the most evil parts of hell. It's where uh, truly their, their evil love is all that they care about. It's not like having a natural regard for self as you might uh, describe yourself as having or, or hoping to have. Now, love for the world begins with the love for ourselves uh, in, in hell. Like... The, the core, the deepest part of hell is love for ourselves and then love for the world. And these are the opposite to the core of heaven, which is love for the... Uh, well, I think I said that wrong. Love, love for ourselves and then love for the material realm, love for the world. It's the material, uh, like, riches in a sense, or, or wealth. And then the opposite is love for the Lord and her qualities, and then love for the neighbor, which is the good in other people in a sense, but ultimately truth. Um, the, the form of divinity around us that we can perceive uh, in our lives. That's how we, you know, that's what love for truth is for each of us, right? Uh, and this love of self runs wild to the extent that it rain, its reins are loosened. Um, and it wants to rule over and dominate all. And it's something maybe you can detect in yourself sometimes, right? Like wanting to... Uh, dominate. It may not be seem to be everything, but sometimes we can get a little bit too controlling. Uh, for, to Swedenborg, this love of self uh, needs to be shed. You know, its varying degrees need to be shed uh, in the sense, to the extent that it wants us to, causes us to want to dominate and control other people. Uh, but it wouldn't stop just at the, the small, you know, situations that might appear in our lives. It goes uh, forever. It would take over heaven and, and the Lord and 
and try to squash everything that's not itself, which is essentially all life itself. Those in hell blaze with this um, hatred towards anyone who doesn't esteem them specifically, and those, and also those who acknowledge and worship the Holy One. Uh, so there's a deep hatred often in hell towards these things. And then because those who are wrapped up in this self-love, um, or those uh, who are like this are wrapped up in the self-love, I should say, they lack wisdom in seeing the true depth of things. And their ideas are limited. Uh, they have no true insight, even in the spiritual realm, where our thinking is actually magnified. And uh, we can become much, much more wise than in our material life, because our material life uh, slows things down, uh, brings other concerns in, other limitations. Uh, our thinking is kind of uh, manifold in the next life, but it can turn to being very limited in a spiritual sense when we uh, are wrapped up in love for ourselves because then our heart, our spiritual sight is limited to ourselves, limited downward and um, closed off from true wisdom and insight. Now, the same people, though, who may end up have having their spiritual sight limited in this way, and, and maybe already do, can actually seem very, very wise, uh, maybe wiser than anyone else in this life, uh, because of their love for using things to manipulate people, uh, to get their own domination and, and their own way. On the other hand, those empowered by love for their neighbor, love doing good and being useful in all its various uh, ways and guises, um, and they often get delight by doing even more good, which is why they continue to rise into heaven. Um, you know, not out of some, uh, you know, bouncer type mentality by God, okay, I'll let you into this party, you've said the right words, but because they actually love doing even more good. And so they um, maybe even gain places of leadership within the spiritual heavenly communities. So, Scripture describes this thing called hellfire gnashing of teeth. And I think we've done a decent job dispelling maybe some of the, the more um, unfortunate translations of, of scripture in our minds, how we think about hell, you know, everyone who's not me goes there, right? Um, but I think Swedenborg takes a section to do a little bit more of that and really hone in on this symbolism. So I'll just touch on this for a moment here. Uh, these descriptions of hellfire are actually metaphors. Uh, so is the gnashing of teeth, as you probably conjectured. Uh, and like how the heavenly realm has a s heavenly sun, uh, heavenly warmth, there's a type of warmth, there's a type of fire, or passion of hell. And it's for one for evil and hatred. And that's what scripture is talking about when it's talking about hellfire. It's opposite to uh, heavenly uh, light and, and warmth. Um, and people in hell are consumed by these hatreds, and so that's where it really, you know, uh, takes on this metaphorical, symbolic picture of them engulfed in flames, where they can't see very far even because of the flames and smoke, right? Um, they're limited by it. In a, in a sense, they're in punishment uh, or torment, but it's the torment of their own passion, of their own hellishness, which they choose, continue to choose, not to relinquish. So they're not actually in fire. And actually, according to Swedenborg, they don't appear to be in fire, even to themselves. Um, but sometimes when you look down, especially from heaven, there may be an appearance like that. Because uh, heavenly light sees things in a spiritual uh, way that truly kind of describes these spiritual truths um, that are manifesting in whatever you know, place they're looking. So they see kind of deeply into what's going on through these spiritual metaphors. Um, and really that's all the spiritual realm is. And those are more substantial than even material, uh, the material world according to Swedenborg because they have real substance. They're really about uh, affection and life. Whereas like a rock that no one ever sees in space, um, of course, has a very 
uh, important place in <laughs> the universe, but it's not, a, you know, representing a deep truth for anyone um, in their own living, uh, which is true, true form, true substance, according to Swedenborg. And so when warmth from heaven flows into hell, though, these appearances of, of heat, even to the uh, hell of spirits, are dispelled and quenched. Um, and the love for oneself is actually quenched. And so the people there feel like they're in coldness because they have no real life force, no real heat, apart from that hellish fire and that hellish um, love for oneself. So to repeat that, if heavenly warmth somehow, you know, is, you know, comes down and enters a hell, all of a sudden seems really cold because the, to the hellish spirits, because they can't receive that warmth. It's not their type of warmth. Their bodies aren't made for it in a sense. They're not making their bodies for it. They're not receiving that from God. Um, and so they're cold. And then when I first read this, I'm like, okay, is this gnashing of teeth? You know, maybe I don't know what gnashing of teeth is, but it sounds like it could be, um, no, he'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, and he says this doesn't happen very often, but it's, it's uh, an occurrence there. And then fire and hell also represents torment there, which occurs when they act out of evil, as we talked about, and they lose divine protection. Um, and they also are tormented by their, their leaders, especially, as uh, Swedenborg describes. So an aura comes from each hell, as we talked about, and it actually breathes out the cravings and obsessions of each hell. Now, spirits heading toward hell sense that aura, and they turn towards it because they love it. It's, it's like at their heart. And they start moving towards it. Um, and because they love that aura of, of um, falsity and, and hellishness, uh, they enter hell, and of course hell grows. And each of these spirits has their own kind of take, though, on it. Um, their own original, like in heaven, their own original hellishness. And each community as well. And so they're, they're false takes, though. So they can't sit by side by side in the true harmony of diversity, as we described in heaven. Uh, we describe heaven as having perfection from its diversity. The more people that enter, the better. Uh, Hell, on the other hand, because they're, it's falsity, they clash. Um, their, their falsities clash and, and, you know, harshly rub up against each other, you could say, uh, with contempt, with hostility, with butchery, even, and derision. Um, you know, it's kind of scary seeing Swedenborg talk about butchery in the spiritual realm, but I guess that happens here, right? Uh, and so that's what gnashing of teeth represents, according to Swedenborg, is this clashing of falsity. All right, folks, what are your thoughts? Any reflections on hell? Uh, we will be concluding uh, the book tonight. It's only like 80 numbers, you know, Swedenborg numbers his sections, much shorter than some of the other sections we've done, but it's hell, right? So the, the stuff, a lot of stuff's new. It's interesting. Uh, and, it, and it's illuminating, I think, for our own life, you know, maybe things to, to reflect on and, and let go of. But we're getting down to it. We're in the last uh, few sections for today. You know, actually, I think we're going to end a little early today. We're not going to finish hell. Oh my gosh, false, false advertising, right? We're not finishing hell today. So maybe Swedenborg was right, it was more eternal than some of us think. <laughs> but we are going to get through one more section. So let's enter in and see what Swedenborg says about the malice and unspeakable skills of hellish spirits. So like how our minds can turn over and decide things much quicker than our bodies can do things, spirits are much superior in spiritual act than we are in the body. So, you know, you can run through a bunch of stuff, got to do the groceries, help out with uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all in like a few, like a moment. Uh, in spirit, Swedenborg is saying, you can kind of actually do those things, especially since your spirit acts out what you're about in every given moment or tries to. Uh, and you're also without the limitations of body and, and things are kind of trippy there, as I'm sure you've discovered. 
uh, and, and that helps with the amount of uh, uh, act that a spirit can be about, um, the type of movement it can do. Uh, and so uh, we're also unlimited by our care of the world, and we become much more spiritually adept. And so heavenly people in this light become uh, angels and discover they are much more wise and intelligent. Uh, hell of spirits, though, find another level of maliciousness and uh, craft in that maliciousness. And the amount of maliciousness that comes forth actually would defy our beliefs, according to this mystic. Partly, this is because they devote their entire being to their craft. They don't have to worry about safety in the same way, uh, their reputation, survival, they're just all about it, and, and it's really a spiritual craft to be malicious, and so they're truly taking the, the form of it um, and become uh, quite adept at uh, trying to do it, at least, doing it. Now, the worst spirits are ones who have been absorbed in evil, even in their life, um, due to their love for themselves, and their internal behavior has been deceitful throughout their life. So they're oriented towards evil, and they're very deceitful in their spirit already, and they're just so used to it that it's just who they are. Um, those are the most, or the worst, East, worst spirits, according to Swedenborg. And all evil spirits uh, try to sniff out good affections and change them into evil ones. And the worst ones want to do this the most, um, for the most part. And they try to lead astray, um, and that's really their delight. That's where they find the most joy is turning goodness into evil. And because they love it so much, they find ways to do this subtly, um, which with much malign skill, as he puts it, so as to remain undetected by the person it's being done upon, by other spirits as well. And when some spirits are examined by angels to, to get a look at what their evil craft is like, they look like spirits, or uh, snakes, spiritual snakes. <laughs> And the tools that they use, they come into spontaneously, depending on their heart and their orientation. Uh, and Swedenborg says, listing all these tools, these arts, as he puts it, would fill a book, and describing them would fill many, many volumes. And he's not interested in doing it. Uh, and many of these are unknown in the world. But he, he lists a number of them before uh, concluding. I won't list them here, you can read them in 581, I believe. And Swedenborg also describes the appearance, location, and number of the hells. Uh, he describes how everything there also has geography, and those who are um, hellish are under the ground. And so in this heavenly realm, beings are on hills and mountains, all these things, uh, in this world of spirits, between heaven and hell, uh, beings are living and acting in kind of this lower area of earth, like uh, valleys or what have you. And then the appearance is that in hell, uh, they're under these environments. In fact, Swedenborg says, under every environment of heaven in the world of spirits, there is a hell. But the holes there to those hells, or whatever the path is, um, only reveal themselves... Uh, if the Lord uh, wants to show them to you, or if you're going into them. Uh, so you don't always like see the, the hellish cavern at the edge of the city in the world of spirits. You know, it only appears when you're like, wow, that looks like a great hole to walk into, <laughs> unfortunately. So, or maybe very fortunately, right? So I find that interesting. He says, if you think about it, you can think of the realm as like, there's like this whole line of, of environments up above, and then like a very parallel hell below each one. And each one takes a different form depending on where they are. There's caves, dens, quagmires, swamps, uh, dark forests. Uh, angels can look in and, and see, you know, what's, how these things look and, and try to, to help, you know, improve some of the situations there. Um, and some hells have ruins, houses that are burned, uh, not burning, but look burned, cities even that look destroyed, also sounds like a zombie apocalypse, right? And then 
there could also be like huts or, or kind of less scary looking environments in the milder hells, he says. And so there are dark forests, so, you know, that lends itself to all our horror movies about dark forests, where uh, hell of spirits roam like beasts, uh, typically with underground caves representing their dens, uh, you know, where they're hiding from light often. And there's also deserts and uh, rugged cliffs with no, you know, life at all and, and just barren wasteland where he says the craftiest from hell are banished even from hell because I think they get up to too much mischief. <laughs> so, interestingly enough. And then there are hells below hells. So, you know, he says there's a lot of layers to these things. Um, but the exact location, even though there's corresponding communities, the exact location is actually only known by the lord of each community of any specific hellish community. But you can roughly estimate it based on their loves. Because like heaven orienting towards north, south, east, west, and each one representing different types of uh, heavenly orientations, uh, which we covered somewhat before, those directions also occur in hell, and the communities kind of fall within these directions in hell. Swedenborg describes that, you know, this is why in scripture these directions are often used kind of very poetically, like the east wind, right? And he says a lot of that has its heart um, and its symbolism in the fact that there is a son in the spiritual realm, as we talked about, which is the Lord, uh, and it is the East. You can call that the East. You can say, okay, that defines the East. And then whether we orient that way or kind of to the side or what have you, um, actually places us in the realm, and that's also true in its opposite, like how we orient towards evil and selfishness. Uh, but ultimately, there's an infinite variety of hell, uh, so, you know, who cares where any specific hell is, right? <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm going to try to finish up today. You know, surprise, surprise. Turns out hell isn't eternal. <laughs> uh, our freedom depends on the balance between heaven and hell, according to Swedenborg. The freedom to choose between good or evil and truth and falsity is never taken away. We can't live without it. We can't live without spiritual freedom. We can't be reformed without it, especially in this life, because... You know, without freedom, we can't love what we find, what we become about as we grow from infancy on. Uh, so freedom uh, is necessary, and it depends on this balance. Now, in the body, our union with heaven and hell is not directly with uh, heaven or hell, but is mediated by spirits in the world of spirits, uh, good and bad. Now, I know before in the book, he kind of says our spirits sometimes appear in heaven or hell, and now he's saying our union is um, mainly through the world of spirits. Maybe it's both. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it can make sense in that regard. But I, I think, you know, whether or not uh, we, we agree on these descriptors, I think we can agree that in this world we can often create heaven or hell within and without. Um, and hopefully we're called to relinquish our hellishness and receive the gift of heavenliness, whether it's from divinity, uh, prospect, you know, pos posterity, you no know, ancestors, the universe, whatever you want to call it, uh, we should receive our gifts from the our higher sources. Now, a whole community can establish communication in the spiritual realm with another, with an emissary, an agent, uh, and this is similar to the spirits uh, that we're connected with in the world of spirit. So, you know. Often in scripture, Swedenborg says the angels represent the Lord, of course, but in the actual occurrence of that angel appearing to whatever person, it was a community or heaven as a whole kind of conveying a deep message or a specific message with, through an emissary who's kind of connected to the whole, at least for those moments. And ultimately, our bodies are an earthly thing we carry around in this world, but our spirit is the actual person that we are, and are forming. That is who we are, folks. It's not about this, you know, ghost who likes to add a little jingle to our, our broadcast you might be able to hear. Uh, maybe even for her, it's not about her body, it's about her spirit. What is she about? What are you about? Um, and that's our true person, as I'm sure you can relate to, you know, what happens within your head 
and your your experience within is really uh, your life, not your body uh, outside of that, right? So hopefully this book club has helped uh, you know uplift some concepts in your thinking, helped you reflect on your own spiritual life. Um, but before we conclude, because we're at the end of the book, folks, we did it. Uh, I want to check in with you folks in the chat seat. Albert says, I was surprised to read that for Swedenborg there's a type of murder which is saying something that damages another's reputation, which is a form of murder on the social level. Yeah, he says, yeah, it is interesting. Um, I found it, yeah, quite fascinating, his description of how, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Albert, how people who want to destroy other people, their spirits, um, they, they essentially look at other people as nothing, uh, they will talk bad about them, are essentially... Uh, committing murder in their spirit because they could, mur they would murder them if they could. They would get rid of their presence, uh, or force them to be exactly like them, beasts, slaves, which is like murder. Because then you're just trying to clone yourself onto other people, which may be more painful than murder. You know, being forced to act like someone else or forced into situations can be tough. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense that that's like a murderous spirit. May not actually commit murder on the material plane, fascinatingly enough. Any other reflections on heaven and hell? Wow, that's that's all the book? I thought there was more in there. <laughs> uh, hell, you know, I, I, I talked about this before, but hell is this big in this book by Swedenborg um, versus heaven, which is like that. Uh, in the world of spirits, which is also very small. Hell is, this is just a little thing. And Swedenborg talks about how hell is transient, in a sense, because ultimately they're about nothing there. And as they learn to avoid doing their evils, hell also loses the, the propensity to keep doing those things. And those things aren't true substance in the sense that they're not about real life. They're not about uh, true... Uh, living, which is actually the the reality of the universe. It gives forth to the reality and it gives things weight uh, in a real sense, in a true sense. So I think it, it's fitting that Swedenborg only wrote about hell for this much. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this before, but I have the title now. Epic of the Afterlife. Yeah, good. Liter a Literary Approach to Swedenborg. Um, and it's by Olaf Lagerkrantz. It's a Swedish name, I couldn't remember it. And he is a famous Swedish writer and literary critic. Um, and he doesn't believe in Swedenborg's thinking at all. But he was asked to write a book about Swedenborg, so he's like, alright, I'm going to critique Swedenborg, let's do it. And what he ends up writing about is how awesome Swedenborg's book, books on the afterlife are. He's like, this is truly the first Western book of the dead. Um, the images in these books are are very uplifting in a sense because they're all about morality and trying to uplift people to live good lives. So he says, you know, I don't believe in this stuff, but I think it's a true literary epic, a true historical landmark. And we just made our way through the entire thing, folks. So congratulations. Uh, <laughs> going forward, I think we'll have some more topical things uh, instead of a book for a while. You know, this, this took a little while. We've had some good interviews, so it's it slowed us down uh, for our Thursday talks, but I'm excited to, to, to delve into some topics with you. Uh, reach out to me if you have some ideas or, or want to share your view as well. Now go forth, leaning into heaven, knowing that you are quite loved.